ready. So we're asking the question, what does my faith say to me when I am freaking out? Now, fear is one of those things that no matter where you've come from, maybe you were born in Ireland, maybe you from, come from a different country, maybe you are a Christ follower, a skeptic, or maybe you're someone here who has a different or watching online an alternative religious belief. One of the things that we all have in common is we all are afraid of things. And some of those things are funny, and some of those things are very serious. And in preparation for today's message, I just Googled, what are some of the strangest rarest, dare I say, funniest phobias that are out there in the world. Now, heads up, let me just do a little disclaimer here. These are actual phobias. I haven't made these up. We can laugh, but understand there's at least a certain percentage of people in the world that for these people, these phobias are very, very real. Not only are the phobias funny, but so are their names. Here's the first one. This phobia is the anatidephobia, anatidephobia. And anatidephobia, believe it or not, is the fear of being watched by a duck. <laughs> You're walking through the park, doing your own thing, and all of a sudden you glance, and there's a duck just looking at you, its head moving as you move across the park. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, this duck can see me. The duck is looking at me. And for some people, this fear is so real that they will never go to the park. They won't go near lakes because they're terrified, not of the duck, but of the feeling of the duck watching their every move. This next one is, is very personal to me. This is pentrophobia. Pentrophobia, in case you can't tell from the photo, this is the fear of your mother-in-law. Yeah, you want to live a long and happy life, men, you should fear the mother-in-law. She can kill you, okay? Uh, and she can do it quickly, with like a mallet in the back of the head, or she can do it slowly over many years through nagging and being a nuisance in your life. But pentrophobia is a real fear. I got this off a list of like 30 of the world's most funniest phobias. And again, no phobia is really funny because for someone it's a very real thing. But when you look at them from, from a distance, when it's not your fear, it's kind of laughable. It's like, well, that can't, be, that can't be a real fear because everyone's fear to them is, is real, but to us is not so real. Here's the point. There may be funny phobias out there, but fear is not funny. Fear is very real. I know we do our best in the Western world to try act like we're not afraid, to try act like fear doesn't exist. But fear is real. You know, and it's kind of like as a parent when you're trying to tell your kids, you know, I, I remember growing up in my granny's house, you had these, these wardrobes and they're more like, like walk-in wardrobes, they weren't really walk-in, but like more like a walk-in enclave kind of thing. And the doors had these lats, you know, like these lats that are like this. At nighttime, you'd lie there with your, with your blanket up, you'd look at these lats, you just feel like there's a duck in there looking at you, not really a duck, but there's something in there. And it's almost like me and my brother, we had this thing where it was like, well, you go look, no, you go look, no, you go look. And I'm the kind of person, the way I was wired, it's like if, I, if there's something in there, I want to know. Like, I, wanna I don't want to find out what I'm lying in my covers at nighttime. I don't want to surprise. I want to face it head on. So I'd rip off the blanket and I'd look all tough and I'd walk over to the wardrobe. My brother's thinking I'm a hero. I'd rip it open. Ah! Now, of course, inside, I'm terrified. I'm like, if something's in here, I'm on the door. Like, he is by himself. I'm gone. I was terrified. But the point is this, is that fear is, is, is real. And fear isn't, 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 it can be funny sometimes, but fear is serious. Why? Because fear affects how we live, right? Because there's many nights where maybe I didn't get out of that bed because I was paralyzed by what could be. And of course, there was nothing in there, right? It was irrational. But for me, it was real. And when you look at studies right now in the Western world, again, this is all connected to the season of life that we're in. Fear is on the rise in incredible ways. There are more people now alive on the earth getting Medicaid to help suppress their fear than ever before. In fact, one study said that there's an 84% 80 84 of people hold on to an irrational fear. 84%. That means, if, like, that means like over two-thirds of this room right now, this stat is correct, we're holding on to irrational fears. They're real to us, but they're not really real. And the problem is, is that we're making decisions about our life, our choices, our direction, based on fears that maybe aren't even real. And, if, and even if they are real, here's the point. God, has, God says something to us about our fear. Now, when you look at our culture right now, you go online, Instagram, you look at the news, look at the newspapers, listen to the radio. Our culture right now is gripped by fear. 
Maybe you're someone watching online or in the room who's afra- genuinely afraid of COVID and afraid of you know, getting sick and getting f- afraid of going to the hospital. And so you're making choices because of that fear. Maybe you're someone who says at the other end of the spectrum, I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm not afraid of getting sick. I'm not afraid of hospital. But maybe for you, the fear is the government bring in a law next month that says face masks and social distancing are mandatory forever. Like wherever we are in the spectrum, we all have fears. Things that, that make us th- think and act differently. And when you stop and actually look at our world right now with all the craziness in the world, in the political world, the economic world, I mean, I mean, the fact that a neighboring country has no petrol, I mean, it's bizarre. The fact that supermarkets are running out of groceries, all the stuff that's happening, we're seeing over, again, it goes back to the whole toilet roll phenomena two years ago. Like, our whole world is literally freaking out. And let's be honest for a second. It's hard to keep your cool and to stay in control, right, when everybody around you is freaking out because it kind of gets on you. I remember someone showed me a video recently on, on Instagram, and I sent it on to some of the guys in our team here, of a person running out of a building, just randomly running out and screaming. And one by one, other people in the building began to run out and scream too. Now, they had no idea why they were running or why they were screaming, but one person's freaking out literally caused everybody else to freak out. And it was all a big hoax. There was nothing to be afraid of. There was nothing happening. But everyone just assumed, oh my gosh, he's running and he's screaming. We should run and scream too. The question we're asking, especially those who are Christ followers, how do we maintain calmness? How do we stay centered? How do we rest assured when the whole world around us is freaking out? And the reason why the whole world is freaking out is because of this, a loss of control. Because there's something about our nature, isn't there, friends, that we like to be in control. It's when things don't go according to plan that all of a sudden we begin to freak out. It's like, I didn't see that coming. I didn't want that to come. I didn't want to happen this way, but it has happened this way. And now what do we do? I can remember March 10th, 2020. I was sitting in, in, in the office with the staff team. I just come back from speaking at a conference in Hawaii, everybody. Come on. You know, God loves some people more than others. And so those he loves more than others get to go to Hawaii. Anyway, but I, got, I, was, I was just come back from Hawaii. Life was good. And all of a sudden this news flash COVID-19, boom, there it is. All of a sudden, the whole world is losing control. And we all know how the story went because we're living in it almost two, two years later. But the whole world lost control and people started to freak out. And the question I was asking myself in that initial phase and the whole way through COVID, and I keep asking myself even today, and the question I believe that this, this message today is designed to ask is, is what, do we, what help do we have? What help do we have when fear causes us to freak out. What do we do? How does our faith become relevant? How, what, 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 is, what is there in God's word? What is there in God's person? What, what is there available to us in God that would help us in the face of fear when we find ourselves freaking out? And to help us answer that question, as always, we're going to turn to God's word. We're going to turn to the first gospel, the gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at chapter 8. And again, if you want to track along today, all of today's notes are in the uh, Bible app by you version. Now, what are the Gospels? The Gospels are simply four accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and John were both followers of Jesus. They were there. They were eyewitnesses. So they're writing their account of what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. And some of the pushbacks we get sometimes in the Christian faith is, oh, the Bible's made up. It's a myth. You know, it happened hundreds of years after Jesus' life. No, no, no. Most of the Gospels were written within the lifetime of the people who were there. Meaning, if what Matthew was making up wasn't real, the people who are still alive when Matthew's gospel was being circulated could have said, bogus, it's a lie. But they didn't. Why? Because they were there too and Matthew's claims were real. They were true. What Matthew experienced in the person of Jesus actually happened. Now Mark and Luke never met Jesus. Mark, we're told, wrote down the eyewitness account of the apostle Peter, and Luke came later. Luke was actually a first century historian and approached the story of Jesus being paid by a wealthy Roman to to figure out what's what's this, this Christian thing? Where did it come from? Go find the facts. And guess what? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say the same thing. Sometimes you get pushed back. Well, there are certain accounts that, are, that have different details. Well, of course, because if you were to experience, if you were to relate your experience of church today and someone else was to share, there would be discrepancies because it's how you're experiencing it. But if the detail changes, then we have a problem. If you say, I was in Lighthouse Church in a swimming pool, and the other person says, I was in Lighthouse Church in a, in a performing arts theater, we got a problem. 
Now, do you know what number screen you're in right now? Is it one, is it three, is it five or seven? It's irrelevant because you're in the room. And so Matthew has this incredible moment in following Jesus where a storm, a storm breaks out in their lives. Not, not a metaphorical storm, as we're going to apply today, but a literal storm. And this storm doesn't only threaten their lives, but it threatens the entire mission and ministry of Jesus. But then something unexpected happens as they begin to freak out. The true identity and the true authority of Jesus is revealed. Not in peacetime, not in the calm, not in church on the hill, but in the middle of a storm. The story starts with this, verse 23. It says, then he got into a boat and his disciples followed him. Let me give you a bit of context. So basically, from kind of chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus has been teaching this large crowd of people. You've probably heard of this moment. It's known by many as the Sermon on the Mount. Basically, Jesus was on a hillside teaching people all about how he is fulfilling what the Old Testament thought. And he has, talks about things like you know, hatred and forgiveness and murder all these things. And at the end of this incredibly long day of teaching thousands of people, Jesus, because where he was teaching was right on the uh, lakeside of the Sea of Galilee. And the reason why it's called a sea, uh, even though it's a lake, is because it's quite a, quite a large body of water. And Jesus decides to get into the boat. And here's the thing. As disciples, if you're in this room and watching online, you're saying, I'm a disciple. I'm a Jesus follower. Like, we're not religious here. I've said this over and over and over again. We are not a religious church. Ireland does not need another religious church. Ireland needs a real church with a real faith in a real God. And so we want to be real about our faith, but real faith must be relevant. It must be practical and be able to work its way out in our lives. And so being a Jesus follower, what does that even mean? It means we follow him. So you go, oh my gosh, I don't do it in my life. I don't have to go A, B, or C. Ask yourself the question, where is Jesus? And follow him. I said last week in the vision message, you know, are you with us? We're with God. It's not that we're with God. We, you know, it's not that God's with us. We're with God. We're asking ourselves the question, where is God? What is God doing? And how can, be we, how can we be with him? So the disciples being followers of Jesus watched Jesus get in the boat and they followed him because here's the underlying belief. The underlying belief is that if I'm with Jesus and Jesus is God, then nothing bad can happen to me. And it saddens me that there, that there are so many versions of the gospel that, that preach or proclaim a faith that if you follow Jesus and you love him, you serve him, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And if you just name it and claim it in the name of Jesus, anything you want in life shall be yours. And it sounds like a wonderful theology when you're watching it on TV. But when you're told your wife has cancer, when you're told you're going to be made, made redundant, when you're told that terrible news that strikes fear into your heart, all of a sudden your theology falls apart because you have a version of Jesus that only works when everything's working well. See, the disciples follow Jesus, but they didn't realize that they were following Jesus into a storm. In fact, maybe if they had known what was ahead, maybe they, they wouldn't have followed Jesus. Maybe that's part of the reason why Jesus did not reveal to them yet what was about to happen. Because at the end of the day, we will see in a second through hindsight that the result of what happened in the storm was worth the storm. Are you listening to me? Sometimes when we're going into a storm or going through a storm, we ask all sorts of questions. Like where is God and why is this, why is this happening and what does this mean and how could there ever be possibly anything good to come of this? But then we pass through, we look back and we go, wow, actually that was an incredibly important part of my life. And God can use all things. Here's the point. The point is being with Jesus does not mean we are without trouble. If you're a Christ follower in this room, being with Jesus does not mean we will be without trouble. Hey, we've gone through COVID. Many of us have had COVID as Christians. Some people have died of COVID as Christians. This is, of course, the point where you who are here who are not a Christ follower are watching online go, so if, if being with Jesus means that you're going to go through the same trouble I go through as a non-believer, then what's the point of believing, right? That's a great question. Well, as we're going to see, as Jesus said earlier in, in Matthew 6, it rains on the just and it rains in the unjust. We both get wet, right? We both, we both go through the storms of life. The difference is going through the storm with Jesus as opposed to going through the storm without Jesus, there's a massive difference. That's the point of today's text. So Jesus leads them on a the boat. They're just following Jesus. Okay, here we go. 
And all of a sudden we're told in verse 24, suddenly, suddenly, March 10th, come on, news break, news flash. I can remember sitting uh, on, on the beach, Waikiki Beach, everybody. It was, it was 10 p.m. I had preached like four or five different services. I was sitting outside in the kind of, uh, what do you everyone call it, the beer garden area, the outside terrace area, sitting down, having a drink, watching the waves. I'm in Hawaii, okay? And all of a sudden we're hearing people talk about this coronavirus thing. China and da 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 and we're like, ah, don't worry about that. I mean, come on, whatever. No big deal. Just the flu. What's the worst that can happen? We're in Waikiki. Life is good. Fast forward the clock, nine days to March 10th, and the whole world is shut down. We're scrambling as a staff to figure out we can't meet in person anymore. What do we do? How do we manage? How do we do church online? We've never been here before. Then, of course, the fallout of of, of economy and people suffering, getting sick, and people in our own church who are literally in ICU fighting for their lives. Boom! Suddenly, this storm came over the whole world. It's unprecedented. Everyone in every nation, in every continent, going through the same storm. But that shouldn't surprise, right? Because when storms come into our lives, they always come suddenly, don't they? I mean, we don't go... I see catastrophe on the horizon, right? It's more like an iceberg right ahead. We don't have time to react. It's right in front of us. We can't get around it. There's nothing in our power. It's out of our control. It's unavoidable. We're going to hit it. It's head on collision. The question is, what strength is there available to us to help us overcome this overwhelming fear? Suddenly, this storm came upon them. Of course, when you talk to meteorologists who study the, the weather patterns of that part of the world, they'll say, even to this day, because of the nature of where the Sea of Galilee is with the kind of warm desert winds coming from the east and the, and the Mediterranean blowing from the west, it causes this convection of, 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 of temperatures that literally suddenly this almost tornado-like weather can fall and descend upon the Sea of Galilee any time. And it can be very, it can literally be catastrophic. It, it can cause the death of many lives. And all of a sudden, these disciples find themselves suddenly in the midst of this storm. Maybe you're watching right now online, maybe you're in the room, and you find yourself suddenly in a storm. You're wondering, what, what, could, what answer, what, what help could there possibly be? What can God possibly do to encourage or strengthen me in my season of storm? Notice also a very important word here. It says that, so the waves swept over the boat. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But suddenly, the storm came over. Next there we go. Waves swept over the boat. This is very interesting because just visualize with me. Visualize their little wooden boat out in this lake. The reason why it was called a sea, like I said, was because it was, it was enormous. It was large. It was like a sea, even though it was technically uh, a lake. And imagine this huge storm, this furious storm, wind and waves buffeting and battering to the point where the waves were so big, they were hitting the boat, going up and totally covering the boat. Totally covering it. Like, like literally, the Greek, word, the Greek word that's used for the word swept is the word klepto, okay? Say with me, one, two, three, klepto. It's where we get the English word kleptomaniac. You ever heard that term? A kleptomaniac is someone who has a problem with stealing. And that's the word that Matthew used, that the waves kind of kleptoed over the boat, meaning the waves engulfed, completely covered. Literally, the storm stole the boat. And of course, highly visual language, right? The idea being, if you looked out at this little boat and see the waves are so big and so enormous and so powerful that literally they were covering the boat to the point where the boat was about to sink at any moment. The point is, the boat was overwhelmed as these waves swept over them. Now, what's interesting is, is that everyone in that boat, well, pretty much everyone, most of them, I should say, were fishermen. And not only were the fishermen, but they were skilled fishermen. And not only were the skilled fishermen, but this was their lake. This this is where they worked every day of their lives, where their fathers worked, and maybe even their their father's fathers. They knew this lake. They knew the Sea of Galilee. It was their lake. And yet they're in this boat watching this klepto storm happening, watching the boat literally be covered by waves, and they are about to be freaked out. Now, what's interesting about this story is that this story is told in all the synoptic gospels. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because they give a synopsis of Jesus' life. John's gospel is far more theological. But each one of the gospels, each author tells a story. In Luke's account, 
of the story. This is Luke, remember the historian. He's now talking after. He's interviewing people. What happened? What was it like? He's trying to establish the facts. The way he records, he says, uh, a squall, again, like a storm, came down on the lake. And again, the, 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 the metaphor or the, the analogy is it literally came. It wasn't there. They were rowing out, just going from one place to another. And all of a sudden, this thing came down and surrounded the boat so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. When do you know, how do you know if your fear is a legitimate fear? Well, there's the answer. If you're in great danger danger. They were in great, this was not some, you know, just some trick or some, some, some lesson. This was serious. They were in great or grave danger. Now, the word that Luke uses when he's recording his gospel for swamped is the word plero. Okay, say with you, one, two, three, plero. And that word in Greek literally means to fill completely. To fill to the top. Do you ever, do you ever fill a water bottle so full that when you try to close the lid, water kind of spills out? That's how full, that's plero. This boat was being swamped to the point where these waves were crashing over this boat, where the boat was actually filling with water. Not only was the boat being surrounded by the water around it, but the boat was beginning to sink because of the water in it. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I don't have a lot of experience with boats or being in the sea or being in water. It's not my favorite thing to do. But here's one thing I know for certain. It's not the water around the boat you should be afraid of. It's the water in the boat. The water around the boat is normal. That's what a boat does. It floats on water. But when water gets in the boat, this is where we have trouble. The boat was not only surrounded by the water around the boat, but the boat was sinking because of the water in it. I wonder how many of you right now in this room are watching online. That's your life right now. I mean, you've been battered and buffeted. You've been covered, swamped, drenched, beaten up, rolled over, turned over, but you haven't capsized. And you've fought and you've stood and you've tried and you've gotten this far, but right now you find yourself panicking because you can handle the water outside the boat, around the boat, but waters begin to fill the boat. You're asking yourself the question, can I continue? What's the point of fighting for this marriage? How do I keep going? Is my faith even worth it? Because right now I feel like God is far away. The disciples were told in the plero and klepto, they were swamped and they were overwhelmed. Now for them it was literal. Thank God there's no water falling in this room today, okay? No one needs to bring an umbrella unless you leave. In which case, it's Ireland. It's probably going to rain, okay? But metaphorically, many of us in this room watching online, come on, we know what it is to feel swamped. And to feel overwhelmed. And maybe you're right now not. Maybe right now you're, you're in the Mediterranean, floating along, sipping on a pina colada because life is good, right? But here's what you need to be told right now. Here's, here's what you need to be reminded of. The weather can change. Suddenly, all of a sudden, everything can change. And we can go from smooth sailing, as the expression goes, to being swamped and overwhelmed. It's so interesting to me as a pastor because it's usually in these contexts when people feel swamped and overwhelmed, whether Christian or unchristian, where people begin to question, where is God in all this? Come on, let's be real. Did you not ask yourself or ask God at least once during COVID, the, the craziest of lockdown, God, where are you in all this? Like if you are God and you're in control, then why is this happening? And more specifically, why is it happening to me? I'm following you. <laughs> I'm only in this boat because I love you and I serve you and I've put my faith in you and I'm following you. So why is there now boat, water in the boat to the point of where it's beginning to sink? Remember, the disciples followed Jesus in the boat. The question is, where is Jesus? Verse 24, second half of the verse. Jesus was sleeping. What? Jesus is sleeping? I mean, what's going on here? Well, it's a very practical sight. Jesus has just spent... 10, 12, perhaps 14 hours standing, teaching thousands of people. And that's just one day. He did that every single day for three years. He's tired. Because even though he's God, he's God in flesh. And Jesus came into the world as a man so he could experience all the limitations that you and I experience in life. One of which is tiredness. I'm at a phase of life now in my mid-30s where I'm realizing that one of my pre most precious commodities is my energy. Because see, I had my first son when I was 20. Raised the baby at 20, 
Let's go. I had two more in my mid-twenties. Let's go. Now that I have one in my thirties. Let's go. Oh, my God. It's like I'm tired all the time. It's like, my goodness, what's wrong with this body? I go and I train and work out and I get an injury. No problem. Next day, I'm ready to go. I'm healed. Now I get an injury. Three weeks later, I'm still broken. What's happening to me? Entropy, my friend. Entropy. The earth is pulling us back to itself. Our body's literally falling apart. As we get older, we realize that we have real limitations when it comes to energy. And Jesus was no different. Jesus, we reckon this time, was in his mid-30s. He just spent all day teaching and he was tired. Now understand, when he got in the boat, there was no storm, right? It wasn't like he was oblivious to what was happening. When he got in the boat, it was just like a car ride. It was like a journey. He got in the boat like you get in a ferry. All is good, all is calm. And Jesus went to sleep. To which you might push back and say, but Jesus, didn't Jesus not know what was coming? Yes. To which we should then ask, well, if Jesus got in the boat when there was no storm and fell asleep, but knew the storm was coming, what is it that Jesus knows? What is it that Jesus has? What is it in who Jesus is? It allows him to sleep when a great storm comes, a great danger that literally could kill them all. What is it about Jesus that allowed him to rest assured knowing what was coming? We'll come back to that in a second. But here's something very important I want you to see, because this is something we all feel, all of us. We go to difficult times, we ask the question, where is God? And sometimes it's hard to answer that because God is God. Like if we could answer all of the questions about God, he wouldn't be God, right? I mean, if we, if we could manipulate or control God's will, if, God, if we could make God be whatever he wanted God to be, then by definition, God is a utensil and not the divine creator of the world. Just like when you get married, if you try to fix your husband, ladies, and you think, I, my hap- the happiness of my marriage is dependent on me fixing my husband, not only will you be miserable, but you will ruin your marriage. Because the person you're married to, male or female, is another person with a free will. Your job isn't to fix them. Your job is to become something together. So the same way when it comes to answering questions about why God doesn't, doesn't, very often we don't have answers. But one thing I can say for certain, as is demonstrated right through Scripture, and as has been demonstrated in the life of every single Jesus follower since this moment in Matthew's Gospel, up to this present time in this room, that God's silence never equates to his absence. Yes, Jesus was sleeping. Yes, Jesus was silent. But Jesus was not absent. He was in the storm with them. And you may feel right now in the room or online that you're alone in this storm, that you're losing control, you're freaking out, the wind and waves, you're overwhelmed and you're swamped, and you're going, where is God? Usually God is not out there. Usually God is right here. To which we should ask the question for why is, well, if God is not out there and God is here, then why is God not freaking out? Why isn't God worried? Well, the same way that we laugh at the funny phobias at the beginning because to us they're not real, maybe all of human fear to God isn't real. Because God has nothing to be afraid of. And he knows that. And maybe part of the lesson in what he's trying to show his disciples is they can know that too. It's interesting to me in verse 25, these experienced fishermen who knew this lake, who knew this water, who who knew these storms were, were so freaked out that literally they ran and woke Jesus saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now again, when you read that, you you can't really read that in a calm way. You can't visualize the disciples going, "Uh, Lord, save us. We might possibly drown. I mean, you can tell by the language, they're freaking out. This is the voice of panic. We all know it. You know when you're really panicking? The other day I was walking in the street and this person was on a bicycle and they almost lost control and they let out a shriek. Do you ever let let out a shriek? It's kind of embarrassing. Ah! Like, it's it's not your normal voice. It's a voice of panic. It's a different voice. It comes from deep within. It's like you're driving along and you almost lose control of your car. You go, ah! Or you scare someone. Ah! It's this shriek. It's this voice. It's other voice. It's deep internal voice of fear. And the disciples come 
full of fear. They're genuinely afraid. And they say, Lord, we're going to drown. Another translation might be, we are drowning. The boat is filling with water. There's no escape, emergency exit. There's water outside the boat. There's water inside the boat. We're fishermen and we're freaked out. We're all drowning. What are you doing asleep? And again, maybe we don't understand this because we're not fishermen, but these are experienced fishermen. And their genuine fear should freak us out. But why were they afraid? They weren't afraid of the water, right? Because you can't get up in the morning and push your boat out to sh- offshore if you're afraid of water, right? And they can't be afraid of the storm per se because they would have experienced many storms on the Sea of Galilee. What are they really afraid of? Well, they're afraid of the same thing you and I are afraid of. A loss of control. It reached a critical point where they couldn't book it out the water as fast as it was coming in. And it began to dawn on them, we're going down. The ship is sinking. And you know, I think there's a sense in where there's a humility in that. There's a humility in our ability to acknowledge that the ship is sinking. Ever had someone you know or you love whose ship is sinking but they won't admit it? They're too proud to admit they need help. They're too proud to take the ring boy, to take the life jacket, to take the lifeboat. They're too proud. They'd rather go down with the ship than admit that they need help, which is tragic because the ship doesn't have, they don't have to sink with the ship, right? There can be help. Two weeks ago, I was at a meeting in Belfast. I was coaching a couple who were getting ready to launch a church like ours in Belfast next year. And uh, they arranged the venue. So I asked them, what's the address? And they gave me the address for the Titanic in Belfast. And uh, I was there in the building. And I walked in and it was quite interesting. And uh, the guy who was at reception was dressed like in a 1930s engineer, little cap and the waistcoat. And it was a really, really cool experience. And he said, oh, you're here for this meeting? I said, yes. He goes, follow me. And I actually go behind the reception, which was quite strange. I had to make sure where he was going. You know, where is, where is he going? He said, follow me. He said, okay. So we follow him. And all of a sudden, we're in this like back area. And there's all these offices. And I said, what, what's this? He goes, oh, this is actually where we have our conference room. I said, how cool. And he goes, this room is the actual office of the man who designed the Titanic. And in fact, everything in the room is original, as it was when he was here. I said, Wow. And he said, and he sunk with the ship. He never came back. So me being me, you know me, a little bit of crack. My f- opening statement to this young couple who were planting a church was, I hope your church plant is more successful than the last thing that came out of this room because it didn't do too well. But as I was sitting there chatting to them and thinking about just the history and the significance, I remember someone uh, sharing with me that when they built the, the, the Titanic, someone said, I don't know who it was, that not even God could sink it. It was unsinkable. I'm always careful when I challenge God like that because usually God wins. It's like John Lennon said, we're more famous than Jesus. And then he wasn't. You understand what I'm saying? And so this ship set sail and all of a sudden it sinks. I'm not going to get into the theology of did God sink the Titanic. I don't believe that. But the point is this. No ship is unsinkable. But at the same time, no storm can overpower God's authority. See, this ship went out in the confidence of the best engineering, the best technology, and the best equipment that's available to man. But then a storm came. Not in, a, not in a storm sense, but in the metaphorical sense of an iceberg. And that ship sank. See, all, all around us every day, there, there are parts of our lives that are hitting these obstacles and sinking. But we don't have to go down with the ship. Because there's help. And there's hope. But it takes humility to acknowledge we need help. Because it's very hard, isn't it, to admit sometimes that we're not as self-sufficient as we thought we were. It's very hard to admit that we're freaking out. We're freaking out, right? That like, I, I, I'm losing control. The ship is sinking. I'm freaking out. And I need help. Next slide, please. And what's really interesting to me is in verse 26 then, uh, so again, let's, let's, let's put this in context as we begin to bring this message to a close. So Jesus in the boat, He's exhausted. He's sleeping. They set sail. All of a sudden, a storm comes. Disciples try to keep their cool. Try to keep it together. Don't send them just yet. Don't wake them just yet. We're going to handle this. It's good. Keep, keep bucketing water. All of a sudden, it dawns on them. We can't bucket water out as fast coming. This ship is sinking. So they run to Jesus, and they wake him up and say, What are you doing? What are you doing? We're literally dying here, and you're napping. Right, as, it, as it feels sometimes. 
What I think is so interesting is this. Like, I don't know how you are, but when my kids come in and wake me like that, Dad, wake up! Dad, wake up! There we go. I don't go, hello, children. <laughs> I'm usually not coherent for the first 30 seconds. It's like, what are you doing waking me up? I'm sleeping. I'm wrecked. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I got a busy day ahead of me because we, this boat is going to the other side. We got plans. We got things to do. Why are you disturbing me? That's how most of us react when we get woken up rudely, isn't it? Get woken up abruptly. What's so interesting is, is when Jesus was awoke, woken, he says, you have little faith. Why are you afraid? Isn't that interesting? Jesus wasn't surprised by the storm. He'd wake up and go, oh my gosh, there's a storm, and start panicking. He woke up, took in a situation, said, you have little faith. Why are you so, like, what, what, what are you so afraid of? Stands up, speaks to the weather, rebukes it, which means tells it to sit down. And the wind and waves stopped, and it became completely calm. One of the reasons why I think God is so good is because in this we see the heart of God. See, Jesus didn't rebuke their disturbance of him. Rather, he rebuked their disbelief. Because, because God can work with our rudeness. God can work with our abruptness. But God can't do anything with our disbelief. For God to move in our lives, for God to move in our storms, for God to move in the world, it may even be the faith of a mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds there is. But there has to be something. See, Jesus knew that because he was in the boat, everything was okay. Because the one in the boat was more powerful than everything around it. He knew that. And he wanted his disciples to know that. He wanted the disciples to grasp the true identity and the true authority of who he was. He wanted the disciples to grasp his identity and his authority. See, when you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, we see that Jesus was teaching about authority. He was talking about authority, teaching about authority. But here in the boat, we're about to see Jesus act in and with authority. See, when he was speaking to the weather, he wasn't only speaking to the fear around them, the klepto and the plero, the water around the boat and the water in the boat, but he was also speaking to the fear within them. Which is often the case, right? Because when we find ourselves overwhelmed and swamped, it isn't just the situation around us, it's what's going on inside of us that God wants to speak to us so often. It's interesting to me that that these experienced fishermen with all their techniques, with all their skills, with all the equipment they had in this storm, as they began to realize the ship was sinking, all it took was one word from Jesus and the storm subsided. They're saying, Jesus, where are you? He said, I'm right here. And they're saying, do something, like perform a miracle, like do, do something magical. And all Jesus has to do to their greatest fear, the thing is causing them to freak out, is speak. Because one word from the mouth of Jesus overpowers anything that we can face in life. He speaks to their fears and his voice brings complete calmness. Wow. How many of us right now in this room, we want that? A complete calmness. You think about your finances. Oh, so much to freak out about. Debts and bills and kids and Jesus, speak to my storm. Give me complete calmness. Think about your health and all the doctor's reports, the upcoming appointment, what it might mean and where it's going to go and, and how it's all going to unfold. God, speak to my storm and give me a complete calmness. You're battling something mentally or emotionally, battling something in a relationship. You're thinking, man, it's out of my control. The ship is sinking. Jesus, speak to my storm. and Give me complete calmness. See, fear lies. Fear is like the storm, but faith speaks. And faith brings a sense of complete calmness. The story ends in verse 27. It says, The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? See, they thought they were following a teacher, a leader, a revolutionary, a prophet maybe. But they didn't realize this, 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 this man, this, this leader, this teacher, this, this, this prophet wasn't just a man. He was God's son in the flesh. 
He wasn't some magician. He was God incarnate. And all of a sudden, they're still afraid, but now they're afraid of something different, right? Because at first, they're afraid of the storm. They're afraid of losing control. But now they're afraid because they're amazed. They're, they're afraid in a reverential sense because standing before them is God in the flesh. To which the question was being asked, well, what were they really afraid of? Were they afraid of the power of life storms or the power of God's sovereignty? Because they've just witnessed the impossible. They've witnessed their leader stand up in a boat in the middle of a great storm in which they're great danger and just speak. And the wind and waves obey him. See, I'm not here to tell you that, you know, um, we can walk out of here with some some, you know, some good advice or, 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 or kind words to make us feel better. I'm here to say that Jesus is the Son of God. And when he is in your boat, when you're following him, it doesn't matter what storm you go through, how bad, how difficult, how serious, how severe, when Jesus is in your boat, you are secure. These disciples, mind-blowing thought, were more secure in the boat in the middle of the storm with the plero and the klepto than they were in solid ground. Because Jesus is the rock. Not only in a physical sense, but in an eternal spiritual sense. It's like Oswald Chambers said, he said this way, he said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And of course, when he says fear God, it doesn't mean being afraid of God. It's a reverential fear of God. They asked the question, what kind of man is this? Who is this? I think that is the most important question, not only of this text and of this message, but it's the most important question in life. Who is Jesus? Because if Jesus is just a good teacher, a good moral guide, a rabbi, a, you know, a great thinker, a great you know, philanthropist, a great revolutionary, whatever, whatever category our culture wants to put Jesus in, then he has no power over our storms. And therefore, I would say, I would submit, is not worthy of being followed. But if Jesus is who he claims to be, the resurrected Son of God and Savior of the world, then no matter what we're going through right now, we can find confidence we can find hope. We can rest in the assurance that as real as my fear is, the klepto, come on, and the plero, the swamping and the overwhelming, I have a rock. I have a foundation. I have a security in Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? As we begin this series, or next few weeks, keep asking this question. I, I want to ask you to think about this. Who is Jesus to you? And maybe you are here online or in the room, and you are a Christ follower, but who is Jesus to you? Because these early disciples, they were following him, but they didn't realize his true identity and his true authority. Maybe today, the great takeaway for you is God wants to reveal to you who he really is. He wants to say, I have not abandoned you. I'm not napping on the job. I'm with you every step of the way. And if you look to me, I'm not the storm. I will make a way out. So the question is, what does my faith say to my fear? How can, my, how can we have an overcoming faith in the face of an overwhelming fear? How can we rest assured in the storm? What help do we have when fear causes us to freak out? And the answer is very simple. The help we have is this. Jesus speaks to us, about us, and over us. Jesus speaks, number one, to the storms around us, and Jesus speaks to the storms within us.